I love plugins. Nice. In this studio deep dive, we take a close look at Charlie Puth's production process and discover five of his hottest tips guaranteed to make your track sound bigger and better than ever. Not only do we hear Charlie give us insights into his methodology and thought processes as he built a brand new song from scratch, we'll also see him using and talking about some of his favorite plugins, what they do, how to use them in interesting ways, and how ultimately they can be the difference between a good sounding track and a world-class production. Let's dive in. Let's think of a melody right now that can play throughout the entire song that won't be annoying. Okay, so I could easily play that in on MIDI like this. Two, three, you could do something like this, like. But in my mind, and Benny Blanco always told me this, like record each note separately, then you have individual control over each note. So I'm gonna, like take my time and just play the F. And then I'm gonna play the A flat. And now the E flat. And now the C. And then the A flat. And then I could easily copy and paste the other F, but I'm gonna play it for different velocity. And now. And then. So now, I'm just going to quantize these just so they're on the grid. I'm going to print it to audio since I hate MIDI. I've just never liked it. I always work. I, using audio and like trimming it and adjusting the attack and the sustain just feels so, feels so final. I don't know. So, see? That little transient right there, I'm going to trim that up and kind of just make it a little... Take the click off so you can... And I want to kind of fade it out a little bit because in my mind, from this voice note, I was doing a little bit shorter. So I'm going to just do that here as well. Okay, I'll make it bigger. There we go. Ooh. That's good. I always commit it. I don't know. You don't have to. It's just something I've always done. I'm going to do the same thing with this A flat here. Oh, I'm going to drag it. Oh. Hold on a second. And look, now it's not going to tail over it. Just fix that little fade. See, it's like going up so you can kind of hear the click a little bit. So I'm just going to do a gentle crossfade. Here's it without the click. Nice and clean. I'm going to do that here too with this. The most important thing for me is making like the rudimental sounds like, like don't worry about the clicks later. Just make it super clean from the beginning because it'll actually uh, inspire a melody if what you hear sounds like a final product. I could easily just like highlight them all and do like the little quick fades, but there's something, I don't know why. I feel like if I do it by hand, it just feels more natural. I could be completely wrong. It could be a complete placebo, but I think you need these fun placebos to make the music sound personal. Like. This is such a huge tip and also a very interesting process to observe because often with production and recording, we're trying to capture the essence of the performance, whether we're playing in a chord progression or a melody or a groove. But in this case, Charlie wants absolute control over each note in that melody. And we can see why he wants that control because he really zooms in and takes a lot of time and care shaping each note, trimming the transients, putting fades at the beginning and end of the note, really treating each note like a separate entity and then bringing them all together. 
And he repeats this process with other elements in the production as the session goes on. Ooh, that's dope. Yeah, that's just... Ooh. Baby. Commit. Audio. Let's go. Do I want that hi-hat there? I don't know. I kind of do, but I'm going to make it a little lower. I do want that little open hi-hat, but I'm going to make it shorter. So, just a little... Commit to audio. Hmm. Now it's on its own track. Ooh. Whoa, what was that? Ooh. Mm. Mm. Like a Pharrell intro. Simpler at the end. Uh. Uh. If I were you and you were using this bass, I would just print it and then kind of just manually drag it, um, all the files uh, yourself. It'll just like be in the pocket, mo better or something. I don't know. See what I mean? Like all this stuff at the beginning. You kind of want in this world here. Mm. Ah. I'll even go as far as just like trim it even more. Ah. Ooh. It's so clean, you want the sound clean like that. Um, same thing, just over. Dang it. So just continue to, that's a little bit more. I'm just gonna blast through this real quick. You get the idea. So if you're in the world of pop production or perhaps looking to tighten up some of your tracks, this isolation of elements, this one note at a time approach could be the thing that really helps you get control over the elements and ultimately delivers the sound that you're looking for. Well, that's actually kind of cool. I could layer that. I think I'm gonna do that. I could layer that. I think that's the way. When I'm first coming up with a sound, I never just use the soft synth because I, I need like some thing of me on top of that. And I'll just do, you know how I like recorded each note separately? Um, I'll do that on my phone. So. Now we're gonna take the notes that I just recorded on my phone. So let me get a. I like that one. Okay. Delete that, put this note. This F goes over the F here, and I think that should be a cool blend. Do a little fade. I'm just layering my voice on top of the synth right now. I don't want it to sound like me. I want it to sound ambiguous. I just want it to, I want it to feel like texture, um, like it was part of the soft synth. So I'm gonna kind of lower it down a little bit. Let's go into sound toys. Ba -ba 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 -ba, sound toys. Um, what's that one thing Benny told me about? Little altar boy. Put it after the EQ. I don't know if that's correct or the right way to do it, but works for me. Change the format a little bit. Mm. See, it doesn't even like sound like I recorded my voice with my phone anymore, it just sounds kind of dope all of a sudden. Okay, so I got all the plugs on there. I want to create a new aux. Just want to make, you always want to like make an interesting sound. And this sounds pretty 
weird and interesting. Here we see Charlie essentially creating an original instrument with a blend of two different sounds. One being the synth and one being his voice. And this layering technique has some huge benefits. Firstly, as he said, Charlie wants some part of him in the sound. He wants to feel connected to the sound he's creating and using your voice is possibly the best way to do that. Secondly, this sound is utterly unique. It's one of a kind because he's making it in real time. And this is really important because if you're using presets on a synth or a VST, chances are there are other people around the world using those exact same presets in their production. And whilst we can tweak the parameters of any synth or any VST to change that preset, Charlie goes a step further and really creates this original hybrid instrument. And then he gets to play around with how much of each sound he blends into the final mix. And I love that final comment, you always wanna make an interesting sound. He doesn't say you wanna find an interesting sound. For Charlie, the sound really only became interesting once he started to make it, once he started to blend these two layers and experiment with tweaking each of those layers in isolation. And even after he's blended the two layers together, he still goes to a great amount of effort to manipulate each of those sounds. He's really looking for something that interests him, something that is unique, something that is different and people haven't heard before. And ultimately, if people hear sounds in your production that they've never heard anywhere else, this really helps your track stand out against all the others. Put like this wonderful delay Valhalla mix that I just got. I love this setting too, the tape setting. I know you're supposed to make like a separate aux for the delay and then feed it to your channel. I just put it right on the channel. It's just more instant gratification. Um, I'm gonna put it to note and make it really fast because like it's not going to act as a delay it's just going to act as a widener because right now it's very in the middle and i kind of want it to i know that there's going to be other instruments surrounding it so i want it to spread eagle as was a weird way of saying that <laughs> mm. this spread little thing here we could bring this up i usually bring it to right here Like I'm already, I, I keep catching myself. I'm, I'm starting to sing. Go back to that delay thing. Um, I just spread it just a little bit. Ooh, might have to. So I'm just like barely. I, I hate using wideners like. A, um, like a, you know, I just like using like delay and that's how they used to make things wider anyway. So might as well just take the highs off just a little bit. That way it doesn't sound so in the middle. It's very, you know, before. Let me take the click off. Before, after. Barely noticeable, but makes me happy. This is such a great tip and it shows us that top level producers are often thinking about how to use their tools in, in different ways, in unusual ways. He's not thinking about using the delay as a delay, the way most people might use it. He's looking at how to use it in an unusual and interesting way and that in turn creates a slightly unusual and interesting effect. And the other interesting thing about this is why he's using the delay that way. He talks about opening the sound up, creating some more spread and really what that means is creating more width because he knows that as he adds more elements to the track, the mix is gonna get more crowded. So rather than just make all the sounds and leave them in the middle and worry about panning or mixing them later on, he goes to the effort of actually creating space as he's creating the sounds. He's using this delay to spread those elements and leave space in the middle for other elements that he might wanna put there later on. This Pro Tools Air Lo-Fi, fun fact, I actually put this on all of my vocals. It just kind of you know, dirties them up a little bit. Put a little, bring the sample right down, give it a little erk. You can just adjust the sample rate to wherever you think it sounds the best. I don't know what you know, technically is supposed to be the right way, but... Everybody uses this RC20. Just give it a little bit of cheap little... Um, and finally, I know I said finally a bunch of times, uh, just 
Brent Skrillex always told me to use this plugin. This is the best transient master plugin. You just. And it's not really giving me the punch, so I want to put it on the track. Bringing the attack up kind of just <clears throat> makes it hit just a little bit. Give it a little movement. Uh, LFO tool is great. If one knob pumper is great too, but. But I don't want it to be. I want it to be. So I'm gonna just put it to uh, uh, half there and kind of just nudge it down a little bit here. A little much maybe. I'm gonna use Fab Filter to open it up here. So I, I want it to sound like this. So. This little thing has to have some more movement. It's just kind of lame if it's just like bang. So maybe just add, a, go back to that Valhalla delay. Just add a little bit. Kind of 1975 sounding. I love Maddie and. Several times throughout this session, Charlie refers to this idea of creating movement. And when he talks about movement, he's talking about movement internally, movement within the sound. And he demonstrates time and time again that he's not just satisfied with leaving the sound as it is. He's always looking for some textures or some motion and movement that can make the sound a more interesting version of what it currently is. And sometimes this movement is subtle. Sometimes it's just changing the texture of the sound, like when he adds the air lo-fi plugin, which he says he adds to all of his vocals. And then we hear some more obvious movement within the sound when he applies plugins like the RC20 and we hear the wobble effect come in. He uses that LFO tool to sculpt out the attack on some of those chords. And then he brings the Valhalla delay back, this time using it as a delay and creates a little bounce on that percussion track. We also see him use the Fab Filter EQ to open and close the filter. And he does this over a four bar period at the beginning of the track. And this is such a tried and tested production technique and it sounds so good because the changing of that sound over those four bars really creates this sense of anticipation for the listener. That's what drives the track forward and really makes some of these sounds more enjoyable to listen to because they're more interesting, they're more unusual. There's more going on beneath the surface. And watching Charlie work here, we really get a sense that he's not okay with anything being static. He's really looking for movement at any opportunity. He's looking for a chance to change the tone or the texture of the sound. He's looking for a way to change it internally with a little bit of extra motion. He's looking for a way to give it a little bit more bounce. And this, when you add all the elements together, really compounds into a rich, full, and very interesting sounding track. And one thing I did, so it doesn't sound super on the grid. I just drag it to the right ever so slightly. I don't know how to nudge, so don't ask me. I just take it and just use my cursor and drag it over. You take each individual hit and kind of just drag this one over to the right, maybe this one to the left a little bit. Because if a human were playing it, it wouldn't be perfect. It would have some imperfections to it. That way I can make the drums like super on the grid and it'll all sound like in pocket. No. So take that to the right a little bit. Uh, this one maybe to the left. Um, maybe that one's just right, right on it. Okay. And this is really extra, but let's be a little extra. This is a little to the right. Next one. Drag it over to the left. Next one to the right. This one. Because mm. then you get like something like delightfully imperfect. Oh, that's so dope. Okay, hold on. Mm. Da, da, da. Burr, 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 burr. Oh my god. I wanna da, da, da. Okay. 
Yeah. Now it just sounds like I just imperfectly, kind of perfectly played it. Like I have rhythm. Which I I kind of do, but not really. This is one of the best tips you will ever hear from a producer. Because Charlie knows that if he leaves everything quantized, everything right on the grid, the whole thing is going to feel too stiff, too rigid, too robotic. And so he takes great care to move the sound just slightly before or after the beat, adding back some of that human feel, adding what he calls these little imperfections. And moving some of these elements just off the grid not only makes the whole thing feel more human, it again makes space for other elements to be placed on the grid. As Charlie points out, if he can make space with these elements being off the grid, later on when he wants to put the drums in, he might want to put them bang on and really sit them in the pocket. So there you have five hot production tips from Charlie Puth and a breakdown of some of his favorite tools and plugins. And the real takeaway here is observing just how much time and care he takes when crafting each of these sounds. So if you're looking for ways to elevate your production, consider taking a little more time and making a little more effort when shaping each individual sound that you're working on. Experiment with plugins and VSTs and look at how you might use them in creative or unusual ways. And look for opportunities to create movement within your sounds, as well as giving each element its own space so that the mix doesn't get overcrowded. Happy songwriting. Happy producing.